What is a circular economy? How can I transition into alternative sustainability professions? What impact do my financial investments have for the community? These are just some of the myriad of questions we will answer right here on the Green Fillers podcast. Hey, I'm Maya Valentin. And I'm this like Lingam. We are the co-founders of Greenfluence, and we are on a mission to empower students and professionals to create a positive impact within the sustainability and responsible investing space. We will bring you very deep insights from our talks with young professionals and industry experts who are engaged with ESG, with climate change and impact investing, and also startup founders with innovative ideas. We will also explore the sustainability challenges and opportunities facing governments and companies, as well as institutions globally. In today's episode, we will be speaking to Tom Bunting. We're really excited to have Tom as our first guest. We both met him at university, and he has amazing passion for the sustainable finance space, and is more than happy to tell you about his love of donuts. No, not Krispy Kremes. Oh, and did we mention he just started a degree at Oxford? You won't want to miss this episode. All right. So, welcome, Tom. Uh, we're so excited to have you as our first guest for our Greenfluence podcast. A bit about Tom for our listeners uh, is that while studying at Macquarie, Tom worked in a number of professional service roles. He started as a forensic analyst at BDO, where he took part in fraud and corruption investigations before diving into the sustainable finance sector. And although he's only been in the space for a short while, he's already had a breadth of experience. From working in operations at one of Australia's largest ethical financial planning practices to the Responsible Investment Association Australasia. He's engaged some of Australia's most prominent companies and asset managers on important issues in ESG and sustainability. Uh, so Tom studied a Bachelor of Science majoring in psychology and a Bachelor of Applied Finance at Macquarie University and is soon um, actually jetting off to the UK and he's going to study a Master of Science in Environmental Change Management. So Tom and I actually are good mates from uni and we played a bit of squash together and um, yeah, Tom, so how's everything going in lockdown? Or what's been happening? Yeah, yeah thanks, Liz. It's, it's good to be here. Um, uh, it's a privilege to be your first guest. Um, and hopefully we don't stuff this up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, lockdown's been okay for me. Uh, I'm, I think I'm very lucky where I'm living at the moment um, in the north part of Sydney, where I've actually, I actually live in a very large LGA. And if you're aware of the restrictions, it just means that I can move anywhere within it. And it's, it's the northern beaches, so I can still go and um, enjoy some of the ocean water. Um, I live very close to a tennis club that's still... Um, is still running matches so I've got a few things to to keep me busy um, but yeah I can't wait to get out of it and I think it's ironic that the next time I have dinner outside the house will probably be outside of Australia um, rather than yeah ra- yeah rather than here just um yeah moving to the UK I, I don't think we'll be out of lockdown uh, <laughs> until October or November but you know what to do yeah that's really awesome Tom and um we'll touch more about your adventures to the UK a bit later but yeah, I completely agree. Like, I guess Maya and myself are also quite lucky to be in an area that it's quite near water and it's quite a nice LGA. So, yeah, no, it's really good you're doing well. Um, and yeah, we'll start getting into things. Cool. Yeah, we'll definitely have to tee up a tennis match, all of us, <laughs> when we can. Yeah. Bring it on. <laughs> but really looking forward to the following conversation. Um, so at university, each of us studied finance. And the concepts of ESG and sustainable finance weren't topics taught in depth in our courses. Can you tell us what made you interested in learning more about this area? And what would you say you are most passionate about? Yeah, no, totally. I, I, I completely agree with it. And I've, uh, I've had some chats with the course director of, of Applied Finance at Macquarie, Lurian Diallo. Mm-hmm. And so I think like most people coming, uh, coming through a finance education, they'll have to come or stumble upon this themselves um, out of, out of self-interest because it's just not presented to us. I did a double degree, as this was mentioning. Um, one was a Bachelor of Science uh, in Psychology um, and the other was the, was the Finance degree. And it was a really interesting contrast as I went through the two. On the one hand, you had psychology uh, really pushing through the onus of compassion in our professional duties um, and tending to people's needs uh, in what we do. 
Uh, whereas on the other hand, finance was, I mean, it's, you know, finance is important because it allows people to save and invest. And I remember my last, I think it was my last psychology unit, actually, it was the capstone, sort of brings everything together. Um, that's the kind of unit we have at Macquarie Uni. Um, there was a great lecturer, a guy called Wayne Warburton, who shared uh, the idea of psychological literacy um, with us, which is basically having a critical mind, but making sure that you use your, your skills for good, essentially. And there was this one quote uh, that he gave us from Martin Luther King, actually. Um, it's amazing how, you know, you, this, these things were said hundreds of years ago, but they still resonate with us now. Um, and the, the quote was the following. He said, we, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Uh, intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only the power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. And it made me reflect. I was like, whoa, like, sure, I might be able to go into finance and make, make money and help clients, um, you know, make successful investments. But what I care about is what kind of world am I, am I building? Is this, is this really, you know, what I, what I want to leave to, to my children? And so all this was going on while in the background, I was working at BDO and it was a great job. And I really enjoyed doing investigations and data analytics and uh, scanning email databases. It was very, it was very interesting, but I think around the one year mark, I was sitting there uh, and, and I noticed in this fine morning, uh, out of the corner of my eye, a partner passing by me who'd been there for 30 years. And it was at that moment I had a crisis of consciousness because two things dawned upon me. The first was I could make a career out of this. This could be the rest of my life. And I could work in a big corporate um, for, you know, the until I'm 65 and retire, Yipikaye, and I think be set financially. Um, and then the second thing that came about was that I'm in this game to make money for the sake of money. There's not much fulfillment in what I'm doing. And it's strongly contrasted with what I was seeing right outside my window, which was climate change, <laughs> a melting planet, and quite frankly, a lot of social inequality that I just wasn't doing anything about. Uh, you know, where the IP IPCC report has said that we need to drastically reduce emissions. Um, the number, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm, I know it's very high, uh, in order to you know, restrain... Um, global warming to 1.5 degrees like there is no there is no later and then like I'm going to save up and then I'll invest it's we need to align all our activities with uh regenerating the planet now and so I thought right I could either go uh I could stop working and go down to Freshwater Beach or Manly Beach here in Sydney and start picking picking up cigarette butts uh off the beach and start you know doing a bit of cleanup or I could make use of my skills uh, and knowledge in finance to go try and affect systemic change in a more impactful manner. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's actually what I ended up doing. And so I chose the path of the sustainable finance sector because I thought it was a really, it's a really powerful movement to, that, you, that you should bolster because it's, it's what's gonna, I think, drive businesses to be better. I really believe in the power of responsible investment because if you think about it, uh, especially with the, with the advent of Milton Friedman, you know, the neoliberalistic shareholder primacy that he was pushing in the 1980s, it places shareholders first and it places investors' interests first. And so companies are often paying attention to what their investors are saying. If you change that message, as well as the conditions with which you give them capital, then you can start to really get them to change their activities and what kind of businesses are going to come to the market. Yeah, awesome, Tom. That was a very comprehensive response and I got so much out of that. I think the, the thing I found really interesting was initially how you sort of said finance was a bit of a mystery to you. And then you went on this journey of like looking at finance from a corporate lens and realizing that, you know, it wasn't something you particularly wanted to do. And you sort of wanted to do something, I guess, better for the planet and uh, make an impact with your skill set. I guess something that you sort of mentioned was the idea of sustainable finance and the whole idea of impact investing. And I do think there are some, I guess, misconceptions in this field. So uh, can you please, I guess, give us an understanding of ESG and impact investing and what's the difference and more broadly, how should we look at responsible investing? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, that's a great question because I think uh, it's such a fast moving space and it's, a, to be honest, an alphabet soup um, of terms and jargon that we can get lost in. And I think one thing that I've really struggled with in the past year is 
everybody wants to come up with a new triple ESG framework that's going to solve, you know, the big, the big problems. Yeah, to, to your question, responsible investing is, it's this movement and asset management and even banking, you could say, where portfolio managers and investors, they're deliberately accounting for environmental, social and governance factors, so ESG, if you will, um, in their investment decisions, in portfolio construction and I think something that we're kind of coming to understand more now, stewardship activities, so things like engagement and voting. Um, and as a result, they're eliciting better real world outcomes for not only investors, but society and the environment as well. And so I think, I think if you wanted to think about it in another way, it's sort of the appropriation of stakeholder capitalism. Um, and so that's what responsible investment really is. It's sort of this crossover between finance and um, sociology, anthropology, um, sustainability science, environmentalism, uh, and honestly, just better management. You know, everybody concentrates on the E and the S, um, but we all forget about governance, uh, which is how companies are run, um, how boards are structured and, and all that stuff. So that's what responsible investing is in a nutshell. I think ESG is probably the most common term for it. Uh, people love to use uh, ESG to describe the entire space, but it's actually just one small corner of the market. And to be honest, well, I wouldn't say it's a small corner, but it's it sort of pervades everything. But it's not it's not the complete picture. It just gives you a rough picture of what people care about, which is that investors are interested how a company impacts the environment and society, and they care about how the company is governed. So. I think to your question then, what's the difference between ESG and impact investing? Um, it's a, I think there's a really, I, I point you to um, a, a spectrum from, uh, from that the actual, the Responsible Investment Association has on all the, e, uh, all the responsible investment strategies that an investor can take on. And on the one hand, you'll have ESG integration. Um, and on the other, you actually have impact investing. So it's very, <laughs> it's very, it's a very good question because they're, they're radically different, um, although in terms of the impact they elicit, but not necessarily in the things that they consider. Both still care about the planet and people, um, but they'll they'll be taking on different approaches as to how you improve them. So I think ESG integration um, is very much about assessing, uh, or it's a different lens to, to understand risk and assessing the operations uh, or operational quality of, of the companies that you're investing in. So a lot of ESG integration will be about looking at how the how your company is managing your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, as we mentioned before, um, because that's in respect to climate change. It'll look at how you're um, managing water or as well, as well as how much water you're using, because that will impact water stress. Um, for, for social factors, you'll be looking at um, what's your supply chain trend chain transparency? Um, do you have modern slavery existing uh, in your supply chain? And that's something that's actually been really taking off now um, with, with the modern, uh, so the modern slavery act uh, that really came into effect from this year uh, in June, where all corporates um, that I think are, earn over or have over $100 million in turnover now have to report on the, uh, on the risk of modern slavery in their supply chain with a modern slavery statement. So that's something that I think is a, an improving disclosure that allows investors to better assess the social risks um, of a business, as well as things like uh, work health and safety, um, labor standards and community relations. And then lastly, governance, um, you're gonna be looking at things like um, how, what percentage of your board is independent? How do you remunerate your board as well as the CEO? Uh, what's the board structure like? Is it a staggered board? Uh, or do they do votes um, once every, every three years? Um, what are your shareholder voting rights? Is it a dual cost, dual cost voting structure? Because all of these things will allow you as a shareholder to have a louder voice and participate in how you can govern that company. Impact is defined by three pillars, intentionality, measurement, and additionality. Intentionality comes down to the investor stating, what are the real world outcomes or environmental and social issues that I care about? They don't have to do anything. They don't have to do anything with business necessarily or investable opportunities. And what are the pressure points that I've identified that I can solve um, with through through uh, enterprise? And so it's really setting that intention clear. There's no there's no next ten years that we can we can not think about this. The time is now. And so that's as as you know as the responsible investment market matures, I think impact investing will will grow disproportionately compared to the other, the other approaches. 
Um, so, so yeah, I hope, I hope that answers your question. There are two very different approaches um, to, to responsible investing and just make sure, I think the big thing is that we always, we always think if something's got a responsible investment label, we go, oh yeah, that's a great thing. It's gonna, it's having really, really good impact. But I think it's really worthwhile looking and investigating what each, what each of these approaches do um, and, uh, and pushing um, people or investors to, to be improving the impact um, that their, that their investment strategies have. Yeah, awesome, Tom. I really like that idea of stewardship and playing an active role, saying your fund manager and being at the forefront of that. That's a very good point you raised. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Mm. You touched on so many points of impact investing. We'll definitely have to run through some more questions at the end because the government's the whole can of worms. Um, but it's also important that you raise a distinction between ESG and impact and that at the moment it's not a complete picture and one of the core focuses of our podcast is actually to explore this whole spectrum of concepts and their unique impacts mm. um, and what I liked is what you said about everything doesn't work in a vacuum and all of the businesses do have an impact on the world around us um, and so we wanted to have a quick look at the large economic framework and you describe yourself as a donut economist. I'm thinking donuts, Krispy Kreme, but uh, you've mentioned before the book Donut Economist by Kate Raworth. Um, can you explain to us what this theory is and why you are a donut enthusiast? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> totally my, yeah, so I am. Um... That's yeah, self-proclaimed donut economist. I, I read a book last year, yeah, Donut Economics, um, and by by a woman called Kate Raworth, uh, and I felt totally inspired um, by what she was saying because I it was it it pretty much broke down um, traditional economic views uh, and theories that we used to understand how we should um, oper how businesses should oper operate, what's the role of government. Um, you know, what, what civil society should do uh, in regard or should view these businesses. But what she did was is she not only broke down the theories with her own, with, with her own under, um, academic understanding, she proposed a new way of looking at the way we should um, govern humanity uh, and the environment um, moving forward in the 21st century in a way that can be um, done sustainably for the next millennium, let's say. So that's really the background about why I, I wanted to be a donut economist, because I think at the end of the day, what it's really trying to say is that I'm trying to be a hybrid professional. I'm trying to navigate this, you know, these, these, or wear these two different hats of like, on the one hand, I want to be an economist, an investor, and a, and a financial sector, uh, and working in the financial sector. But in the other, I'm also really caring about the environment and society. So that's really what donut economist means. And I think that's where the, the private sector is, is heading. Um, to your question of what donut economics actually means, um, it's actually really simple. No, it's not Krispy Kreme. It's probably the healthiest donut you've ever had. Um, it's, it's, and I encourage the listeners to Google it. It's pretty much um, a set of two concentric circles. Um, one is smaller and goes within the other, and it looks like a donut. Um, the inner circle is, uh, is, represents all the social foundations that humans need to, to be provided um, in order to thrive. Um, in, and in a very just manner. So things like education, sanitation, um, uh, you know, the right to vote, um, you know, uh, law, the law and um, justice systems. But at the same time, we need to be able to be able to provide all of those um, services and amenities to human beings for them to thrive um, within the means of the living planet. Uh, and this is what I got really passionate about was donut economics says it's not just about maximizing uh, or, or finding equilibrium in a, in a market. It's also recognizing um, we need to look after the uh, households um, because we don't recognize like the, the, the actual benefits that they have for, you know, for, for working professionals. If the, if the working professional didn't have a household uh, to go to uh, then, or like, you know, a welcoming home, then they couldn't rock up for work feeling fresh and productive the next day. But we don't even talk about, it. that's not something that um, we recognize as important, um, at least in, in public policy discussions. Uh, and so what donut, what the outer concentric circle, I've just gone on a bit of a tangent, but what the, out, what the outer concentric circle is all about is saying we need to be recognizing and prioritizing those things that improve the fabric or mend the fabric of society 
within the means of the living planet. Because if you don't, you get things like climate change, ocean, ocean acidification, phosphorus pollution, uh, and a whole bunch of other environmental consequences um, that quite frankly, throw the ecological systems uh, or the different spheres that we have on the planet out of kilter um, and means we can't, you know, we can't, we can't function or live well. I think if the, I went, I went to a lecture uh, a couple of years ago from this, uh, from, and it was given by this guy called Andy Pittman, um, who's a, I think he's the research director at the ARC Center for, um, for Climate Extremes, ARC Center for Excellence in Climate Research, uh, Climate Extremes Research something like that, it's a very long name. But he was basically saying that if we get to four degrees, he said, if we, if we get to two degrees of warming in the planet, um, then it's, it looks pretty bad and humanity will struggle, we'll have a, you know, we'll, we'll lose out on a lot of um, economic growth and whatnot. If we get to three degrees, then agriculture, I mean, two degrees is bad, but agriculture will start to go out the window. And if you get to four degrees, um, then, and I'm not kidding you when he said this, he said, that's like, that's like jumping off a 100 meter cliff and coming up with a plan as to how you're gonna survive the fall. You're not, it's over. So donor economics is sort of saying, hey, let's recognize those, let's recognize the dangers of getting to a four degree warming planet. Um, the systems that we rely on to, to keep us uh, in a, on a healthy planet and consequently find ways of running society and providing everything everything people need um, to thrive in a way that's just for the planet otherwise we can't we can't live in the first place i think we need to it's, it's really about a balancing act which is i guess an equilibrium um, between you know between the environment um, and society's needs so um yeah so so kate sort of goes into what that looks like um in terms of political and economic systems and how they need to transform yeah, awesome, Tom. I think um, hearing you, I guess, talk about that concept, I'm getting really hungry for a donut. So um, <laughs> we're locking the Krispy Kreme run one day. <laughs> um, no, but I do find this concept very fascinating. I think a lot of us for the past 200 years since the Industrial Revolution have thought about, I guess, economics as, you know, how much money can we make, increasing GDP, um, increasing fossil fuels. And that's been the sole focus. And now, like, looking at this concept of having some sort of boundaries um, in ways that humans can effectively live. Um, I think it's really fascinating. And I think we need to adopt this model for us to not jump off that cliff, as you mentioned. Um, so I, I think you did say about how you have that sort of title in your LinkedIn, but you'd want that to be a point where I guess everyone understands this concept. And I know we've touched on this a little bit, but you are going to Oxford and you do want to promote that message. So just tell us a bit more about that and yeah, how yeah, no. the adventure came about to Oxford. Yeah, no, totally. No, good, good question, Miss. Um, yeah, so I, full disclaimer, I didn't dream of going to Oxford um, for like growing up. It wasn't like a, a big goal. I, I think um, what happened was, is yeah, I picked up, I picked up donut economics um, by, by Kate and I felt, like I said, completely inspired. And I went, can I go learn and study with this woman can i equip myself with the skills and knowledge uh to go and you know to go and make this a part of my make this a part of my career um and build you know build build that network uh and so um and so i i looked up is there is there a way or opportunity to go and and work with her and truth of the matter is is that she teaches at a course in oxford and i went okay well i think a master's in sustainability would be perfect for me to become more of a, I guess, a knowledge broker at the nexus of governance, finance, and sustainability. Um, but it also offered me an opportunity to go and explore that interest with Kate. So threw my hat in the ring. Um, geez, it's you got to really want to do it uh, because it's it's a lengthy application process. I mean, it was CV, um, transcripts, uh, two thousand up uh, a two thousand word essay. Um, again, it can be any uh, example of academic writing. Um, three references, two of them have to be academic, one professional, and a personal statement of up to a thousand words. So that was a lot of sweating and groveling uh, to my references. <laughs> like, can you <laughs> can you please give me a, a really nice um, a really nice reference? Um, but anyway, so uh, yeah, so then I so then I applied um, around January, and yeah, uh, and then Oxford came back this October. No, that was October. Sorry this um it came back in March and said yeah come along which I 
I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't believe because I thought, um, I thought, honestly, I went into it going, I think I'm ready and I'd love to do this, but it's, it's probably a little bit beyond me. Maybe I don't have enough experience. You know, you get all these doubts in your head, but you do things yeah. anyway, um, because I thought it'd be good practice for next time. Uh, and yeah, so they, so they, so yeah, got, got into the course and it's, um, as you mentioned before, um, environmental change and management. Uh, and so that's really looking at um, how, you, how you can consider um, first of all, sustainability science uh, and the environmental changes that we'll see that will take place um, throughout the Anthropocene that we've already seen, but are, are, will, will come to manifest themselves um, uh, and how we can make decisions uh, that really consider a broad range of st stakeholders with legal, ethical um, and environmental underpinnings um, that make sure that we navigate the, the most just, uh, just path forward, really. Um, and I think that's that's exactly what donut economics is about. So she teaches on the on the faculty, and that's something that um and that's something that I'm really looking forward to 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 doing is learning from her. But um also I think the things I'm I'm gonna it's gonna be a really good opportunity for me to explore some of my other interests like that I was mentioning before, like um, how we can how we can increase uh, financing for nature based solutions um, through what I what I what I come to discover is called um, blended finance, which is basically uh, public and private partnerships um, to, to really um, provide governments um, financing in order to uh, provide public goods. That's amazing. And we need to be able to channel more capital into that. How we do that um, is, still, is still evolving. And, I'll, and I'm definitely interested in exploring that more while I'm at Oxford. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's definitely something I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into. I have to write a 15,000 word dissertation God, um, we'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, I think that's what the research is gonna focus on. A couple of other things that I'm looking forward to doing is um, joining the Oxford Sustainable Finance Society. Uh, that's actually, I think that just got launched last year. Wow. And, uh, yeah, which is gonna be fun. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the founders was actually from the course that I'm gonna study, environmental change and management. Um, so that'll be that'll be really fun to, to get into. And I think, again, provide those networking opportunities that I'm looking for. Again, the course is only a year, so I think I have to get there and hit the ground running, right? Because you don't have much time. Amazing. Yeah, you'll have to keep us updated on how the UK actually approaches all this too. I think we're quite <laughs> bubbled in in Australia. We think everything's very green. And I mean, we are surrounded by water as well. So we have yeah. very <laughs> different problems as well to many other countries. Um, but I like that idea of Seychelles Blue Bonds because the government is committed to being part of that. It's like a circular economy yeah. theory as well. Um, impact um, is defined but by going three back pillars, to your current career, um, so Tom, your current career path has been in responsible the investor investing, state. and that is really quite unique. Uh, many students aspire to start their careers in this field. What would you say were your main challenges in landing your first role? Mm, yeah, good question. I think um, I think the biggest issue that I had was probably knowing where to start. And I think it's frustrating that a lot of us, like we we start uh, we we make a decision when we're eighteen, um, or like assuming you didn't take a gap year to go into a degree, and then by the end of it, we're probably a completely different person and not really in love with what we decided to study. And often is the case now that commerce students are going, oh, I actually want to work in sustainability, but I don't have the background. And I think that was, that was a, I think if I, I hope I've communicated, that was the struggle that I had. I went, oh my God, I care about the environment, but I just don't know how to, how to be a part of it. And I don't have a, a science degree, um, I, I do, but it's in psychology. It's not really relevant to sustainability. How do I, how do I get into this space? So getting started i think was was the was probably the biggest challenge because for me passion is something that i don't lack I, i'm sure it's the same for you guys willingness to learn and hunger to make an impact is something that we have in spades um it's it's just that we don't have that we don't necessarily have that knowledge so i think the the big challenge um was just coming to the conclusion of doing what makes sense i've got a background in finance that's what i'm good at let's say that's what i know so how can i make my my skills relevant to sustainability and i think that's that's something that we that we're not really uh, that we forget ourselves at, 
forget forget about is that sustainability isn't necessarily a business problem it's society's problem um so i think everybody has to play as to as to play a part in our transition to a, a sustainable future what that part is will really depend on you and i'm sure you can have an impact in whatever field you're in i think the cool thing about the course that i'm going to go study is that we're all coming at this from different backgrounds it's a cohort of about 25 people and i think only two of them are involved in finance the rest are in photography the rest are in public policy you know like in, in, a, in a whole different bunch of fields um, that are seemingly unrelated but they've all got their part to play in in, in, the, in, the, in the sustainable transition so that's what that's what i think we need to focus on is like don't go oh my god i don't have this focus on oh my god i've got this particular angle i've got this particular skill set that needs to that needs to be um that needs to be appropriated to the sustainability field and then go and explore how you can do that um because i mean that's um yeah like i said that's just what that's just what all of society has to do so you know it starts it starts with you um and so in my case it was okay i want a career in and i'm gonna have a career in finance i guess but how can i make like how can i go and do something in sustainability okay i'm gonna go to sustainable finance you know or if i just study business or a bachelor of commerce or a major in marketing then you can go join uh, an environmental company or you can if you can't and you just join you know a bog standard enterprise then you can look at at um you know helping out with a sustainability team or trying to set up like a sustainability initiative or sustainable sustainability reporting there's it's there's no one best way to go about it it's not just about getting a degree I think it's about using your skill set and what you know and appropriating that to the sustainability movement. And honestly, that's probably stronger than just having a sustainability degree. I think it's I think it's about walking the path between two worlds that makes you unique um, instead of being one dimensional. I think you just have to remember, and I've heard this advice before, is that you one you want to you you're going to be a generalist uh, as an ESG professional. You won't be you won't be a master of one. You'll be sort of across many issues. Um, and so it's good to do really wide reading um, to get an idea of what you wanna go and do. Um, and second, I think the best thing that I did uh, in starting and in, in getting involved in this is setting up the likes of LinkedIn and networking with people. Yeah, no, Tom, that's actually a fantastic answer because I think the first point you mentioned about how in sustainability, we need people of all different skill sets and that's something I can relate to as well, because like I'm currently in tech and as I've mentioned to you, I want to get into this field, but I can probably use some sort of my tech background understanding of risk as, a, as I guess an advantage for me. So mm. it's definitely not the be all end all, I think. And that's a really good point. And yeah. I think the other good thing is like the idea of kindness and paying it forward. Like I think with Maya and I, we try and make an effort to speak to people and we're more than happy to give other people advice or pointers. So I think that's just how we should move forward in this field because I guess we are still, you know, a small community when you compare it to like a lot of other professions. So mm -hmm. I think it's really good to build that community. So yeah. um, I think that's just like a huge sort of investment in yourself and your future. So yeah. I guess like on that note, um, I know you're not a financial advisor, but can you tell us what your best investment has been financial or non, or I guess non-financial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, not a not a financial advisor, so probably <laughs> stay away from um, yeah, from talking about a stock or something. But I think I think to be honest, and this is actually echoing Warren Buffett's advice, so maybe it is good investment advice. Um, is invest in yourself. I think the best thing or the best money that I've spent this year uh, is probably uh, on a tennis membership at my local club. We've still been able to play through the pandemic, and um, I'm probably getting about six to eight hours on court every week uh and i've you know that's all free it's all included in the membership which is like 250 bucks and i think i get like six or six or eight hours that's about 200 bucks a week of court time anyway so that's been that's been crazy value and doing that kind of stuff uh as an outlet and having that balance not being so one-dimensional um has been absolutely instrumental in coming to the work that I do um, and feeling well um, in, in, in doing it and feeling sharp. So definitely, um, yeah, definitely best, best investment I've made this year. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, I think, I think Rhea has also been a very good investment for you as well, Tom. Um, yeah. So I guess what are some of the things that you've really enjoyed in your role? I know you mentioned a bit about this before, but I guess yeah. just quickly, like what's been the sort of 
main sort of thing you've enjoyed and you know those I guess light bulb moments you have Can you, yeah just yeah, give yeah, us a yeah. Bit of an understanding of those yeah no totally totally I think um I think Ria has been working at Ria has been just phenomenal um I think I, I guess on on that point it was it was I wanted to get into the sustainable finance space but I didn't know how to and I think the great thing about Ria is that it just showed me that you can still make a huge impact uh and still learn so much um, even though you haven't gone into UBS Wealth Advisory or the ESG Equity Analyst Team at Macquarie Bank, um, that's great work as well. But there's so much to do um, in in other businesses too, and and Ria was as is, is one of those. I think the the three things that I, I feel like I'm talking like a management consultant speaking of three, <laughs> the three things um, that I it's awful. Um, it's like a slide deck as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's good, right? It's, it's good to yeah. come up with a headline, but um, the three things that I got out of Ria was uh, learning. I learned a ton about responsible investment, um, not just in terms of the different approaches, um, but uh, how nuanced it is between asset classes. And I think that really, that really get, gives me um, a really good backing before I get to, before I get to Oxford is I've looked at how sustainability um, and engagement, for example, is different between fixed uh, fixed income um, and listed equities or infrastructure. It's not it's not all the same. It's, there's no one size fits all. And I think that that background and learning that I've had at Rear has been super precious um, for the, for that reason. I think the second thing that I've had is unique opportunities that you don't get anywhere else um, in the space. Rear is a small organization that makes a huge impact because we've I, I was working on the certification team. And what we essentially do is, for better or worse, we're sort of like the RI police uh, in Australia. The ASIC in Australia, the regulator, doesn't actually, hasn't actually stepped up and created a lot of guidance or restrictions for managers who greenwash. It's really, it's really taken off in Europe with the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. It's taking off with the SEC in America. It's happening in New Zealand with the FMA. But ASIC is sort of still trying to get there, still trying to wrap their head around how to minimize greenwashing. They're definitely making progress. But in that absence, Ria has sort of taken this, this leadership role in this, in this space means that everybody can sort of define their own cool, responsible investment strategy. Um, but when they come to Ria to get certified, they're, they, they, have to, they have to clear quite a high bar in terms of the operational um, and disclosure requirements that we have um, for all products. And I think it's just been so cool to work with investment managers and have that influence. I've had a, like truly like had a big impact, um, not just me, but it's, not, it's really just part of the program and what it's doing. I think the, my, my successor who's working there now is going to have a lot of fun and not just learn, but yeah, have some great opportunities to, to do presentations um, and practice their business development, develop standards. Um, but then, like I said, also carry out the, the instrument, the certification program to affect better change um, on the ground with, with asset managers and their investment products. So, yeah, that's really what, what RIA has been about. And then obviously the, the networking comes sort of as a part of all of that. I now know a lot of people in the space and it's been fantastic to get their unique angles and, and backgrounds and, um, and build, that, build that community of practice uh, that is honestly super small. And if you can get in, um, which I don't think it's hard because everyone's really friendly, then it's it's hard to leave because everyone is just, yeah, it's, I don't know where else I'd want to go in the sustainable finance sector. Because honestly, it's just, it's like I said, I think it's the way forward um, and it'll invariably grow. Like I said, I'm hoping that sustainable finance won't exist in 10 years because all the finance is sustainable. So let's say you had a time machine. What advice would you go back and give to your younger self? Mm. Ooh, uh I've been getting this advice recently um, and it's actually something that I think I could have used a lot earlier, which is don't take yourself too seriously, chill out. And you just, I mean, and just trust in yourself to navigate the future, uh, navigate the future well. And it's things like, I think only 5% of your life is within your control and just trust yourself to be okay in the other 95%. And yeah don't um don't let your ego t get to your head just don't take yourself too seriously love yeah. that advice no i think i can definitely resonate with that because it's like we sort of magnify and look at our own problems but really other people they don't even realize it and i think yeah. um it's just a matter of us being aware and you know not taking ourselves too seriously as well so i think that's very good advice um 
So Tom, I know you're a keen bookworm and you love your podcast. So like, what are some sort of recommendations that you can give to all our listeners? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Podcast. I would go to John Treadgold's um, oh, Good Future Podcast. I think it's been, that's yep. been really helpful. And I like seeing, that as well. <laughs> yeah. Seeing the different leaders um, in the space, uh, you know, he talks to people at um and you know tideline he's even yeah he's talked to yeah and some other large asset managers here in australia as well and how they're leading esg as well as some super funds um i think books um probably it, i can't recommend on economics i think i think we've, we've talked about <laughs> enough, uh, enough about that i'm actually going to recommend um kate's husband's book um roman chris who actually grew up in sydney he wrote a book um called the good ancestor which is all about uh, long-term thinking uh, and lends itself to the sustainability movement as well as the sort of the, the sort of mind you need to be in um, in order to make these better decisions. And it's it's honestly what I've it's honestly what I've sort of held on to um, for for a lot of these months. Just going like if I think things are bad in the short term, just remember like the reason we the reason we go for a workout or the reason we. Um, don't eat that cake is for is so we can do better in the long run um, and I know those are very simple examples but if you just ha if you develop that mindset I think life will be a lot sweeter even in the seemingly difficult times awesome so the next question is if you had three wishes for the planet what would they be uh, uh -huh. Where do you start? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's big, eh? Um, how do I not reveal my my political stances? So, <laughs> no, no. Um, I think that I've had this question before. Um, I think the first thing that I would do is I'd get all, I, I'd wish for all human beings to let go of their egos um, and not take themselves again too seriously. I think that's, um, that would make, that would make us do decisions that are not so self-interested and more in favor of the collective and as well as make us more long-term instead of being short-term and, and extractive. I think the second thing that I would want um, for the planet is for everybody to be educated. Um, I think education, at least mine, was really instrumental in influencing not what I think, but how I think uh, and giving me critical thinking skills to make um, better decisions um, for myself and for others. Um, and so I want everyone to have a, a first class education because not, I mean, not only that, it also gives you more opportunities. Um, and I think the last one is pretty, pretty bog standard. I just wish we stopped emitting carbon tomorrow. <laughs> I think it would, uh, yeah, really relieve a, relieve a lot of problems um, because I think that's going to be the next, that's going to be the next big wave of transformation. We have the industrial revolution that we've got to, now we've got to go through um, de, yeah, decarbonization revolution. I don't know. People want to talk about, the technology revolution but in terms of energy at least and making us more productive or finding ways to to live that doesn't have as big an adverse impact on the planet yeah we need to stop emitting carbon so if that could be done tomorrow which is a pipe dream um yeah that would be awesome but yeah so that's why it's a wish for sure thanks so much tom yeah all good so i guess this brings us to the conclusion and firstly, thanks so much for coming on. Um, it's so great to actually be able to speak to a peer who's had so much experience in this area already. Um, you've talked so much about not only impact investing, but breaking down concepts um, from a real practical standpoint. And I think we have a lot to learn and our readers have mm -hmm. Our readers and listeners will have a lot to um, continue to explore and we definitely wish you the best of luck as well going to Oxford and hopefully you'll come back and you will also share some of those learnings with us. Totally, totally. Thanks. Thanks, Maya. Really, um, yeah, it's a, like I said, it's a privilege to be here and it's uh, the first round. So hopefully, <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully you haven't, uh, hopefully haven't set a bar too low for people to clear. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think no, you've no, set no. a, I think you set a very hard, a very high bar, Tom. I think like you've really, you've really set a good scene, and I think it's really awesome that we have someone young, like around our age, who's like so passionate about the field. I think um, you've got such a great opportunity at Oxford, and I'm so keen to hear more about it. And it's been really good. Like I guess, I guess having a chat with you over the past year and 
seeing your journey in RI and it's, it's honestly, it's provided me like a lot of inspiration um, for me to be involved in this space. So really, I really appreciate you coming on board and all the best in the UK, mate. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chris. thanks, man. It's a ple yeah, pleasure, guys. Really, really enjoyed it. Great, thanks, Tom. Have a good one. Thanks.